Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's web conference titled Secure Milk Supply Plan. With that, I'll turn the call over to Elizabeth Clark. Elizabeth, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for the Secure Milk Supply Plan webinar. Um, I am Liz Clark, and I work with the Professional Development Services Branch. Um, today's speaker is Dr. Danelle Bickett Weddle. Um, Dr. Bickett Weddle is a South Dakota native who earned her DVM from Iowa State University in 1999, her Master's of Public Health degree from the University of Iowa in 2003, obtained diplomat status in the American College of Veterinary Preventative Medicine in 2006, and completed her Ph.D. in 2009 from Iowa State. Danelle worked in private practice followed by industry as a dairy nutritionist, then entered academia. In her role as the Associate Director of the Center for Food Security and Public Health at Iowa State University, she managed the development of materials for USDA APIS National Veterinary Accreditation Program for 10 years. She currently leads the Secure Milk Supply Plan and co-leads the Secure Beef Supply Plan, which involves business continuity guidance in the event of a foot and mouth disease outbreak. Her passion is biosecurity. Her mission is to educate and inspire others about diseases and their prevention, empowering people to do the best job they can to care for animals. With this, I will hand it over to you, Danelle. Thank you very much, Liz. I'm excited to talk to you all about the Secure Milk Supply Plan which is a federal, state, industry, and academic partnership. As an introduction, if foot and mouth disease is diagnosed in the United States, it will be considered a national animal health emergency. There will be movement restrictions put in place for animals and animal products. What does this mean to the dairy industry, which is a very just-in-time supply industry? Anytime we would disrupt movement, we're going to impact the normal business structure for both the dairy producers, processors, and the retail side, and potentially affect the raw milk supply availability. This makes pre-event planning critical to maintain the dairy industry's survival as well as control foot and mouth disease. So these are the components that led to the development of the secure milk supply plan. We'll do just a brief introduction about foot and mouth disease virus. Many of you are aware it's the most highly contagious virus of cloven hoofed animals, cattle, pigs, sheep, and goats. Fortunately, it's not a public health concern, and many people refer to this as hoof and mouth disease because it is an animal disease. It will cause blisters or vesicles in the uh, mouth, on the feet, um, on the tongues of cattle, and as well as the teats that we worry about on the dairy side. These will result in production losses because the animals are not able to eat because of the sores, their feet are sore, and thus milk production will drop. Fortunately, we haven't had this disease since 1929 in the United States. So why should we be concerned about foot and mouth disease? This information comes from a 2012 paper that you see listed at the bottom. At that time, the OIE had 178 member countries. 66 of which were free of foot and mouth disease, which you can see circled on the Holstein cow in her graphic there. However, 96 countries are endemic with FMD and have never been free of it. Five countries were recently free and suffered from a reemergence of a foot and mouth disease outbreak. So it's everywhere. Um, we've been very, very fortunate to keep it out of our borders, but it makes us concerned if it were to ever enter, and thus why we need to plan uh, for the worst possible case scenario. Fortunately, we have some tools on our side to help us accomplish that. The Red Book, or the Foot and Mouth Disease Response Plan, put out by USDA APHIS, um, provides us with the critical activities that we need to use to respond to an FMD outbreak, focusing on infected premises as well as contact and suspect premises. For farms that have livestock but no signs of FMD and no connection to an infected premises, the Red Book refers to the Secure Food Supply Plans for more information. So the Secure Food Supply Plans focus on continuity of business for premises that may not be infected with FMD but are affected by the movement controls put in place in that control area. These two pillars, the Red Book and the Secure Food Supply Plans, provide that overarching support for responsible regulatory officials 
our states, our federal, and our tribal officials to carry out response activities for animals and animal products, like milk, during an FMD outbreak. When we look at the overall goals of the secure food supply plans, they're very much aligned with the foot and mouth disease response plans. We too are very concerned with detecting, controlling, and containing a foreign animal disease as quickly as possible. We also want to avoid interruptions in animal or animal movement to commercial processing from farms that have no evidence of infection during that outbreak. We also want to provide a continuous supply of safe and wholesome food to our consumers. And finally, to maintain business continuity for producers, those that transport products or animals, as well as food processors through our response planning. There's a couple of web links there on the slide that you can learn more information at USDA APHIS or our Center for Food Security and Public Health about all the secure food supply plans. Let's talk a little bit about business continuity planning. The concept of creating protocols and procedures before an event which may allow agriculture and food industries to maintain some critical aspects of business or to enable a more quick return to business during an animal outbreak response. This can only be accomplished if the risk for those animals and animal products, which could still spread disease, can be effectively managed. Bio business continuity planning can help minimize the unintended negative effects of the disease and the disease response on ag and consumers, controlling or eradicating disease without destroying the industry, while at the same time achieving the goals of disease response. The continuity of business planning concept for foreign animal disease is a relatively recent concept. Risk-based solutions include things like biosecurity protocols, risk assessments, developing best management practices, and intensive surveillance plans with the goal of maintaining production of safe, high-quality food. And we're going to talk about the efforts specific to the secure milk supply plan in today's webinar. In the USDA FMD response plan, you will see the um, control area pictured there, which includes an infected zone and a buffer zone that are established around the infected farms. A quarantine can be put in place to, um, on the operations that house susceptible animals, and movement off of these operations will be by permit, which is based on risk of that movement. These movement controls will be in place until the control area is released. The secure food supply plans, which includes the secure milk supply plan, are working on business continuity for those that are affected by the movement controls but not infected by the disease. So why do we need the secure milk supply plan? We have very frequent milk movements. Milk is perishable and considered a just-in-time product. There is limited capacity and time to store raw milk on farms or at processing plants. And if movement is stopped during an FMD outbreak to limit disease spread to animals, this could lead to milk disposal problems on dairies and lost income. Pre-outbreak planning is critical to controlling an FMD outbreak and for business continuity for the dairy industry. The SMS plan is a work in progress funded by USDA. The guidance developed to date is the result of extensive discussions in partnership with the dairy industry, universities, state and federal officials. Participation is voluntary. One goal of the SMS plan is continued movement of milk and milk products with dairies with no evidence of FMD infection. The Secure Milk Supply Plan provides tools to help producers protect their herds from FMD exposure. The SMS plan is developing guidance for producers, haulers, processing plants, and those issuing movement permits during an outbreak. It is not too late to be a part of the discussion. Much more work remains. The Secure Milk Supply Plan has a number of partners. On the national side, industry representatives participate in a variety of working groups and provide topic expertise. The academic partners include uh, my staff and co colleagues here at Iowa State University, Dr. Jim Ross, Dr. Molly Lee and myself, the University of California Davis, specifically the Western Institute for Food Safety and Security, and the University of Minnesota Center for Animal Health and Food Safety with Drs. Tim Goldsmith and Amy Hunt. 
USDA SIA provided the risk assessment team, and Do Dr. John Zach with USDA's National Preparedness and Incident Coordination Center has provided the funding uh, to ourselves and several partners listed here. You can see that a variety of states and regions um, are working on secure milk supply plan in, in various milk markets. Some of these have been in existence longer than others, and each are at various stages of the, of the planning process. This graphic illustrates the diversity in milk production among the SMS regional partners with active planning on the SMS plan. This date is uh, from either 2014 or 2015, depending on what the, what the data piece is. You'll notice that not all the 10 states are act top 10 dairy production states are actively planning. Um, this tends to be due, due to a lack of human resources or the financial capital to work on the state or a regional plan. However, all of the information developed to date at the national level and within the states is shareable when those states are ready. The effort is definitely gaining momentum with the goal of ensuring milk movement from uninfected farms during a foot and mouth disease outbreak. So these state and regional partners participate in quarterly conference calls to share progress reports, documents, lessons learned, and collaborate on the overall goal of business continuity for the dairy industry. For states that are interested in learning more, we encourage you to participate in the calls or contact myself or one of the national SMS plan team members. During the dairy outreach meetings and throughout the SMS plan guidance documents, the goal is to prevent the potential spread of foot and mouth disease virus. Producers are responsible for keeping their herds free of infection, just like they are with any domestic disease they're faced with. The focus is preventing exposure. Our responsible regulatory officials, those at the local, state, tribal, and federal officials, are responsible for protecting animal health during a foreign animal disease outbreak. Their goal is to prevent spread. Therefore, they're the ones that will determine the requirements to receive a movement permit when a dairy finds itself within a control area. The SMS plan has developed guidance for moving milk during an FMD outbreak, and we'll discuss that complex issue next. The pieces I'm going to describe to you next are from a document re released very recently, October 11, 2016, entitled Milk Movement from Control Areas in an FMD Outbreak. During an FMD outbreak, our responsible regulatory officials have the authority and responsibility to establish those control areas around FMD-infected premises and to manage movement. They must balance the risk of allowing movement of raw milk against the risk of not allowing movement and thus the necessity for on-farm disposal of raw milk. Processing milk from a control area must always include pasteurization. The decision to move milk will depend on those risks as well as characteristics that are unique to each outbreak in that particular control area. So based on how milk is moved today, a risk assessment was done to see how easily FMD virus would spread from farms that had infected cattle but didn't know it. We refer to these as infected but undetected farms. Normal appearing cattle can spread the disease because they can shed the virus in bodily fluids two to, day, two to four days before clinical signs appear. It's also important to remember that foot and mouth disease is not a public health or food safety concern. There were two risk assessments completed, one that looked at the likelihood of transmission under current industry practices, and the other that took extra biosecurity mitigations into place. We'll review some of those highlights in this webinar. One of the first questions answered through the risk assessment was, can FMD virus escape from a tanker as it moves down the road or during pumping on the next farm? When additional biosecurity mitigations were followed, these are known as biosecurity performance standards, such as closing the dome lid, tightening the dog legs or clamps, and making sure the tanker is not overfilled, the risk is negligible to low. Negligible means the likelihood of the event will occur is insignificant or not worth considering which is reassuring to other farms along the movement route. A low risk means it's very unlikely that the event will occur. 
Using current industry practices and the grade A standards in the pasteurized milk ordinance as guidance, the risk assessment found there is a moderate to high risk of FMD virus spread from those infected but undetected farms. People handling raw milk, like haulers and processing plant workers, contributed to the risk of spread, as did milk transfer hoses. Milk tankers that are not cleaned inside and out after offloading milk also increase the risk of FMD virus spread. With a virus as easily spread as FMD, no one wants their cattle to fall ill. The good news is when the risk assessment added in the biosecurity performance standards for raw milk and collection and transport, the risk was reduced to negligible in many, but not all, categories. Contamination of the tanker, cab, and hauler can raise the risk of FMD virus spread to moderate. Truck and driver biosecurity, including cleaning and disinfection, are very important steps in preventing FMD virus spread. The full results of the risk assessments, as well as an executive summary, can be found on the Secure Milk Supply website under Plan Components, as you see pictured here. The website is securemilksupply.com. I mentioned the biosecurity performance standards as a component of the proactive risk assessment. These were developed during the risk assessment process using the etiology of FMD and a common sense approach to biosecurity that would prevent FMD spread during the collection and transport of raw milk. The biosecurity performance standards and some best management practices were developed by members of the various Secure Milk Supply Plan working groups. The final draft of these were posted to the Secure Milk Supply website in 2005 with some updates done in 2016. We are currently developing online training materials in English initially to pilot these concepts. The goal is to mitigate the spread of FMD virus by milk trucks, haulers, and drivers. It's important to note that these are only guidelines. The biosecurity performance standards were initially completed in 2012. The risk assessments were completed in 2015. States and regions have also worked with their industry on implementing those biosecurity performance standards, and some challenges were identified, which required modification of the original set of biosecurity performance standards. Things such as challenges with requiring a farm-dedicated hose on all dairies in the mid-Atlantic states, the weather challenges faced by northern climates in winter months without good options to overcome them, and the water shortages to be able to clean and disinfect every, every milk tanker every time it entered the dairy in certain parts of the U.S. The risk assessment helped shape some of the mitigations. The lessons learned from porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, or PEDV, helped shape the line of separation concept. And the 2015-16 HPAI outbreaks stressed the importance of having site-specific biosecurity plans. Biosecurity can certainly offer protection from disease when effectively and consistently implemented by everyone. However, a routine level of biosecurity is just not sufficient to protect animals from a newly introduced, highly contagious disease like high path avian influenza, foot and mouth disease, classical swine fever, or African swine fever. The animals just do not have any immunity to these diseases. And these diseases will cause animals to shed high amounts of virus and those around them have very low levels of resistance. So we recognize biosecurity to keep out highly infectious diseases is expensive, and it's very inconvenient to people to consistently implement. It should also be noted that losses from foot and mouth disease infection will be very expensive to producers, the industry, and U.S. animal agriculture as a whole. And the disease is very inconvenient for cattle due to the lesions it causes. Again, how do we balance that risk? So recognizing this, the principles of biosecurity for the secure food supply plan focus on providing tools to help producers keep their animals from becoming infected. There are three concepts that all dairy operations should be ready to implement in the event of a foot and mouth disease outbreak in the U.S. First is an operation-specific enhanced biosecurity plan. Second is a biosecurity manager who can help develop and monitor that plan. Third is the concept of the line of separation. 
The goal is to not have anything cross the line of separation that could introduce virus, recognizing that outdoor housed animals are more difficult to protect from infection, but the line of separation concept can help decrease that infectious burden. Existing biosecurity plants for dairies may offer protection against endemic diseases, but heightened precautions are needed for FMD. Therefore, the Secure Milk Supply Plan now includes a whole farm self-assessment checklist for enhanced biosecurity, which is based on the known exposure routes for foot and mouth disease. This checklist and a corresponding information manual can be used to develop an operation-specific enhanced biosecurity plan. It's important to let you all know that we are creating unified materials across dairy, swine, and beef so that there are consistent messages when it comes to foot and mouth disease response planning. We recognize there are facilities out there that have multi-species on them, and we want to make sure the message is consistent for that industry. We want to also thank all the people that offered uh, comments and suggestions to strengthen the document, um, which will be available on the Secure Milk Supply Plan very soon. So these documents were actually modeled after a poultry checklist which was a lesson learned from the 2015 high path avian influenza outbreak. The poultry checklist was revised and incorporated into the National Poultry Improvement Plan in August of 2016. The poultry checklist includes auditing. The SMS checklist leaves that decision to the state. So the checklist encourages dairies to identify a biosecurity manager. The biosecurity manager will develop the operation-specific plan with the help of their herd veterinarian and the information manual for enhanced biosecurity. Foot and mouth disease will test the effectiveness of biosecurity practices. Everyone on the operation needs to be aware of and follow the written plan consistently, making training and sometimes retraining very important. Let's talk a little bit about the first concept we discussed is the line of separation. This is a clearly identified boundary around or within a dairy premises to separate off-farm traffic from on-farm movements of vehicles, items, people, and animals. It's recommended that you only cross a line of separation through a controlled access point following appropriate biosecurity measures. So let's take a look at this graphically relating to an outdoor um, rate, an animal facility with outdoor raised animals. So the purpose of the line of separation is to limit the movement of FMD virus onto a premises and exposing animals. You could call this line of separation anything you wanted to, a premises perimeter, a, prim a perimeter boundary area, but the goal is to limit exposure of animals that are housed behind that line. To visualize the line of separation concept, picture the dairy as a castle. Think of the line of separation as a moat around the castle. The drawbridge is the access point, which is controlled by the dairy, not by the driver. You decide when to lower the drawbridge and let in the milk truck or any other vehicle after it has followed appropriate biosecurity measures, such as being cleaned and disinfected. In the most risk-averse approach, every milk tanker entry should come through a controlled LOS access point. However, we asked ourselves, how different is that public road you see out in front of that red line in front of the dairy? How different is it from the path to the milk house? Well, it really isn't. So we can modify the line of separation for this particular operation to keep the tanker outside the line of separation during milk collection. So depending on the layout of the farm, the drive path to the milk house and shared driveway space, the milk house could be considered outside the line of separation for this particular farm. The hauler does all their normal tasks and when done, the farm personnel would need to wear protective gear that's not worn around animals and clean and disinfect the milk house after the hauler has left. That would bring the milk house back inside the line of separation for normal daily activity. This makes the door from the milk house the critical control point during milk collection. Let's talk a little bit more. So we have to balance the impact of biosecurity. 
Recall that the risk assessment factored in the various biosecurity performance standards for route milk collection and, and transport. So those specific biosecurity performance standards are what we refer to as truck and driver biosecurity, not whole farm biosecurity. When these truck and driver biosecurity principles were applied, it reduced the risk of milk movement to negligible. But that's not the same as an acceptable risk something regulatory officials and the industry will have to factor in during an outbreak. We discussed how this is a complex issue and how regulatory officials must balance the risk of allowing movement of raw milk against the risk of not allowing it and disposing it on farm. So will they move raw milk until told to stop or do we stop it until we're permitted to move? It's a big balancing act. So this discussion and complex issue led to the creation of a draft document called Milk Movement from Control Areas in an FMV Outbreak that I referred to earlier. It was initially created after a permit call with the Mid-Atlantic State Veterinarians. It was shared broadly for comments in July and August of 2016 and we appreciate all the comments we received on this. The current draft provides the flexibility for regulatory officials to manage milk movement according to their collective judgment and the circumstances surrounding the outbreak. So let's take a look at some of the recommendations that are in this document. So dairy premises that are in any FMD control area that are not designated as infected, suspect, or contact will be informed by responsible officials that they either continue to move milk to processing, which may require that the dairy has a premises identification number and some form of pre-certification by their state if deemed necessary, or they must stop moving the milk, become a monitored premises, which requires having a valid premises identification number, be inspected to ensure adequate biosecurity and surveillance is occurring, and obtain a movement permit to move milk to processing. For farms that are designated as infected, suspect, or contact, this document recommends that they are not allowed to move milk until an issue, a permit is issued. So again, different classifications for the different farms within that control area have different options. For dairies designated as monitored premises, we mentioned surveillance to prove no evidence of FMD and virus infection will be necessary for milk and animal movement. Let's talk a little bit more about what that will look like. So the foot and mouth disease response plan in Appendix F refers to secure food supply plans for surveillance for continuity of business purposes. We're drafting documents for beef and dairy and we'll be sharing them soon for broader review. Let's talk a little bit about what is in those. So dairies in an FMD control area will need to implement a formalized process for daily herd monitoring or active observational surveillance to document there is no evidence of FMD virus infection in their herd. This will require training of herd health monitors to look for abnormalities and health parameters. If found, they're going to need to report those suspicions to regulatory officials who could visit the farm and investigate further. This is meant to supplement laboratory testing. It's not a replacement for it. Right now, there are two primary diagnostic tests being considered on the dairy side, the bulk tank milk PCR test and oral swab PCR test. To address the need of looking for abnormalities in the herd, the USDA funded the development of an FND pocket guide for cattle. This resource followed cattle through initial exposure to day 18 of lesion resolution. This is available in English and Spanish in either a booklet format or a wall chart, and we have free PDFs available online. You can find those on the Secure Milk Supply website. So using those cattle guide images and other resources, online training materials have been created in English. Once they're finalized, they too will be posted on the Secure Milk Supply website. They'll be narrated in English initially, pilot tested, and then translated to Spanish. The other surveillance tool for dairies that I mentioned was the bulk tank milk PCR FMD test, which was validated on a negative cohort of animals, but not with positive cattle. APHIS is currently writing a policy for its use. The delay in test results, however, could preclude its use as a just-in-time milk test. 
And since FMD is not a food safety concern, its use as a diagnostic test will be aimed as a herd health screening tool. Let's talk a little bit more about that test. So milk is collected um, every day from a dairy farm, um, either from the farm bulk tank um, or at a plant if a farm has direct shipment of loads. Uh, the licensed milk hauler is the one that collects those samples, and they're tested for butter fat, protein, and, and milk quality, and as the basis of payment for the farm. So what you see here are a variety of ways that this test they uh, provide us information. So for all farms, the bulk milk tank is only on lactating cattle. So animals that are being treated with any type of antibiotic are withheld from the bulk tank and not in the sample, nor are any heifers or dry cows. On a small farm, um, a sample, a bulk tank sample could represent all lactating cows, possibly twice, um, if they're on an every other day pickup. On our large farms, it may represent only a portion of the herd um, if they require more than one milk pickup per day. So large farms, um, depending on how their milk is stored on farm, whether it's going into a tank or a direct load, uh, may or may not represent the entire lactating herd um, in one pickup. So these are things that have to be factored into the policy for use. So normally in peacetime, the samples are transported to the processing plant. Um, and then sent on typically to a commercial lab for testing. That's where we look at quality and, and all the basis for payment. Um, in an FMD outbreak, we would have to get the samples from the farm to a non lab, National Animal Health Laboratory Network Lab, because those are the only labs right now certified to do any type of foot and mouth disease testing. So the goal is to have the shortest turnaround time for results on the herd health. But this can take anywhere from you know, 24 hours or a little bit more to get results just based on how milk samples are typically moved, which is why we talk about the delay precluding it as a just-in-time milk test. So there's more information to come related to the bulk tank PCR test. And stay tuned to the Secure Milk Supply website for information as it becomes available. The other surveillance tool I mentioned was oral swabs. The ability to provide a very high degree of confidence that animals are negative for FMD virus using our currently available validated laboratory testing methods and sample collection protocols for large groups or certain types of animals is limited. We need additional surveillance for non-clinical animals needing to move within or outside of a control area. Things like young stock that are moved off of our farms very commonly for rearing uh, pre-fresh animals that need to return to calve on the dairy. So our non-labs can perform a real-time reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, or RRT-PCR assay for foot and mouth disease. Sensitivity of 94, specificity of 99% and, and can typically run us in four hours. Um, but more information is needed, and this is a discussion we're excited to engage upon, is which animals and the frequency to apply this diagnostic test as a surveillance tool for permitting animal movement. Another piece is, is there a possibility for future development and validation of a pen level test, such as the use of ropes to collect oral fluid samples? This would eliminate individual animal restraint and possibly provide uh, pool sampling, which requires less laboratory resources. So again, more information to come. So the SMS plan also aims to provide guidance for decision makers on issuing movement permits for milk and animals. So based on the proactive risk assessments we discussed, permitting guidance is being developed. This will facilitate the managed movement of milk from premises within a control area that are not known to be infected without creating an unacceptable risk of disease spread. So this is going to involve producers, haulers, the processing plants, and regulatory officials, because they're all part of that requesting and receiving and decision-making process. Draft guidance documents have been created for each one of these audiences. The guidance will illustrate components that may be required for managed movements and to request permits. 
They provide guidance for those various stakeholders on the components or the standard operating procedures that are necessary to meet those. They are aligning these permitting processes with other commodity species and the emergency management response system, which is the official data management for animal health emergencies managed by USDA. HPAI, unfortunately, provided a real-life exercise when it came to the permitting process. Um, so this is being utilized as permits are developed for the movement of milk. It's very much an evolving process, and you'll see my colleagues here, Tim Goldsmith and Amy Hunt's email addresses. Uh, they're working on these currently. So if you have any questions or want more information about those, we encourage you to reach out to either of those people. Once milk is moved from the farm to processing, there's some additional guidance recommendations that the National Secure Milk Supply Planning Team has created for our milk processor colleagues. Foot and mouth disease is an animal health issue, not a public health issue. However, since cows can shed FMD virus in their milk up to four days before showing clinical signs, milk movement is an important control step to ensure animals are not exposed. So standard milk pasteurization, the high temperature short time, and some cheese processing time and temperatures that are currently used in the United States are not sufficient to completely eliminate FMD virus from dairy products. Again, FMD is not a public health or food safety problem, but it can affect cattle, pigs, sheep, and goats that are consuming milk that hasn't been pasteurized. Controlling milk movement is focused on controlling spread to animals, not to people. There is no research on the higher times and temperatures ability to fully inactivate FMD virus. So as we talk to processors and they look at the normal 161 degree Fahrenheit temperature, they all report we're higher than that, but the research that was done um, ha hasn't, hasn't been updated uh, since the new uh, higher temperature and, and longer times have been utilized in our industry. So we do have a question mark out there as to does it eliminate more virus than what the original research showed us? Uh, at this time, we can't answer that. The U.S. Dairy Export Council funded veterinarians at our Center for Food Security and Public Health here at Iowa State to conduct a literature review of what is known about the inactivation of FMD virus in milk products. The take home message, the research is old. Uh, it's not fully indicative of today's processing standards, which I mentioned. The only place FMD can be researched is on Plum Island, New York, and there are no commercial processing facilities there. Some processes that our um, milk plants use are proprietary, so there's not a good way to state that specific procedures will inactivate the virus. Many early experiments used in laboratory equipment to simulate commercial pasteurization uh, conditions and there's some concern that this might not actually accurately measure the effects of our modern commercial pasteurizers on FMD virus titers. Fat droplets and casein micelles are thought to help protect FMD from inactivation. Milk fat and protein are also thought to protect FMD virus from inactivation by changes in pH. So we weren't able to answer and give the U.S. Dairy Export Council a list of products, um, but it did identify some gaps in our knowledge that hopefully can be researched in the future. This publication is available on the Secure Milk Supply website under FMD Info. So the World Organization for Animal Health, the OAE's Terrestrial Animal Health Code, provides guidance to us on um, trade of, of products. And when we look at Article 8835, it gives us procedures for inactivation of FMD virus in milk and cream for human consumption. And uh, point 36 gives it to us for animal consumption. So right now, if a uh, U.S. outbreak were to occur, the only published guidelines we're relying on are those by OIE's Terrestrial Animal Health Code for domestic movement. So let's look at what some of those recommendations are. So in the Terrestrial Animal Health Code, you can see listed here in order to inactivate foot and mouth disease virus in milk or cream for animal consumption, which is on the left, or human consumption, which is on the right, there are a variety of approaches. So let's look at the human side. Um, if we have a pH of less than 7, which normal milk is 6.6 .6 to 6.8, 
Um, the high temperature short time pasteurization, which we use as a bare minimum here in the United States, will accomplish that goal. That's under point two. Uh, we do have UHT in the U.S. It's not um, very prevalent, um, but we do have UHT available. So on the human consumption, I'm, I'm very comfortable. When we look at the animal consumption piece, so what would be an animal consumed product? Um, there are products that are produced from cheese plants that get fed to our, our cattle and our pigs. Um, there are um, byproducts of production. There are returned grocery store products. So if it expires on the grocery store shelves, um, it's been pasteurized once and comes back to the plant. So it gives us some guidance on how to handle that. And number two seems to fit with most of our plants um, that I've spoken with. So they normally do a high temperature short time, even higher than what OIE recommends. Um, and sometimes they're getting the pH of that product to drop or they're drying it out when you think about calf milk replacers. So again, we have options to make sure that we are, are minimizing our risk of foot and mouth disease virus in our products to animals and humans. So this is something we talk about with processors and our state officials to consider when they're developing their secure milk supply plan. So we have a couple of processor recommendations that have come out of this information. Um, again, it's an animal health issue, not a public health issue. So using those OIE guidelines and the guidance under Grade A Pasteurized Milk Ordinance, we are stating that at the beginning of a foot and mouth disease outbreak, it is not necessary to recall from commerce for human consumption pasteurized milk or milk products that came out of that control area. We are also recommending that milk products for animal consumption that have been treated to those OIE standards I just reviewed also do not need to be recalled. But milk products for animal consumption which may have originated from an infected herd and were not treated to those standards should be recalled and destroyed or further processed. So again, these are part of the recommendations for our processors and our state animal health officials to look into. So several accomplishments have occurred to date, and we've talked about a lot of those, um, but let's talk a little bit about where we're headed. So the Secure Milk Supply Planning Team continues to address issues related to managing an infected premises that is not depopulated. Why might that be? Well, the outbreak could be very large, and we've decided to move away from a stamping out procedure, um, or it could be a prolonged outbreak. So we've drafted a document and shared it with our regional secure milk supply partners to collect input on acceptable options for milk from those infected farms. Um, the risk assessment looked at very low level of virus infection before clinical signs were detected. So we know work is needed on managing milk from infected farms as well as managing our infected animals through to recovery. Many issues remain to be discussed. My colleague, Dr. Kristen Obink, here at Iowa State University leads the development of this document, and we um, welcome additional comments um, and suggestions as the process ensues. Well, no doubt there's been a lot of successes of bringing our groups together and, and discussing all of these pre-event issues, but challenges still remain. So I mentioned the pre-certification process for farms or these processors. It's been discussed by several states. Um, some find it to be their choice um, to manage secure milk supply plan. Others find it a little daunting uh, due to lack of human resources. So again, it's, it's a challenge and one will consider, continue to work on and support the states in their decision making process. Information management. You can imagine drawing a circle in certain parts of the country where there's a lot of dairies. How do we manage that information and provide timely and scalable permitting? The EMRS, Emergency Management Response System, has come a long way and, and provides us with a lot of tools um, and it's something that we all need to learn more about and, and incorporate our permitting guidance into. Foot and mouth disease vaccine surge capacity. Having enough vaccine as well as the infrastructure related to tracing those animals that receive it, distributing the vaccine, and administering it to accomplish the successful implementation is something that we're very engaged in right now. Consumer outreach and education remains a key objective, essential to the business continuity aspects of all parts of the dairy industry. And finally, the mitigation of risk to the rapidly growing dairy export market. It's exciting to see our products shipped overseas. 
Um, but we need to, to look at what ways can we mitigate that risk and can we hold on to some of those exports should FMD be diagnosed. So this is, uh, requires work with the processors, USDA's National Import and Export Services to explore options and our California partners are leading the way on this for us. So besides the resources I demonstrated throughout the webinar, there are many more available for dairy producers, states developing plans, and USDA personnel to learn more about this Secure Milk Supply Plan. If you go to securemilksupply.org, you can look under the FMD or foot and mouth disease area for a lot of different information. That inactivation of foot and mouth disease document I mentioned, vaccination information. Um, a dairy industry manual, if you're not very familiar with how the dairy industry is structured, there's a manual there to help walk you through it. We have a lot of material under this section called training materials. Pictured here are some farm signs um, when we start talking about setting up your line of separation or your premise, premises perimeter that can help um, let people know that this is a biosecure area that they are entering. Um, there's six or seven slides. They are available in English and in Spanish. Um, things for identifying the milk room as it's being cleaned um, or milk is being picked up if your milk room is outside the line of separation. We have a series of farm biosecurity posters also under that training materials tab. Um, three different ones depending on who the target audience is available in English and Spanish and we've, been, we've done them for the dairy industry as well as the beef industry. You can print those out. They're designed as an 11 by 17. Um, you can print them as an 8 and a half by 11. It, it's a little small, um, but if you've got the capabilities to print them a little bit bigger, um, you'll get good quality images um, and easy to read instructions for your uh, farm visitors. We have a series of videos and handouts also available under training materials. Um, our partners at uh, the Western Institute for Food Safety and Security in California um, have put together some great videos as well as our, our partners in New Jersey on a milk tanker cleaning and disinfection. So as more materials get developed, uh, we encourage you to check back to these areas because this is where um, more resources will be available. So again, visit securemilksupply.org for more information. If you have questions um, or want to become more engaged or want to join the, the calls that are done quarterly, uh, please in email us at smsinfo at iastate.edu. That concludes my presentation and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, I do have a written question. Uh, it is, how can APHIS VS folks get more engaged in the SMS activities and outreach? Excellent question. We uh, do have a, a group of people that participate in our quarterly calls. Um, so if you want to email the web link uh, that you see there on the, on the web page with your name, uh, what part of USDA you're in and, and your email address, uh, we can get you added to the uh, contact list and the quarterly update conference call. That would be great. Do we have any um, additional questions? As of now, we don't have any more written questions, Elizabeth. Uh, I can go ahead and give instructions for the verbal questions now. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as we move to the Q&A portion of the call, please place yourself in the question queue by pressing pound 2 on your telephone keypad. Voice over computer users, please select the raise hand emoticon from the top toolbar. You will receive a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please then state your name and question. Once again, pressing pound 2 on your telephone keypad will indicate that you wish to ask a question. And I do have a, a caller right now who wishes to ask a question. And they have dropped off. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and unmute the line now. Please go ahead. Bala, hi, your line is unmuted. Please go ahead and ask your question. Please make sure you're not muted at your own side. Hello, my name is Doris Olander from Wisconsin. Is the question going through? Yes, it is. 
Okay. Hi, we have the largest dairy goat state in the country and we're expected to expand to uh, double in the next five years. It has significant cheese production and we're getting some massive dairies to the order of seven to 10,000 lactating good does. Has the dairy goat industry been engaged at all in all of this? Doris, excellent question. Um, they have not to date. Um, so if if they want to be engaged, we are we are open to everyone. Um, the principles behind biosecurity uh, really doesn't matter if it's a goat or a, a you know, whole scene standing on the other side of that fence. Um, so the materials that have been developed on the secure milk supply plan for lactating dairy cattle would certainly apply to the lactating uh, dairy doe uh, population as well. And the price of milk is sometimes double to three times uh, cow milk and the cheeses are selling for $20 a pound or more in some cases. So we don't know much about these processes either especially since a lot, quite a bit of this cheese is marketed as raw milk cheeses. So, um, Certainly, so yes, I'm, I'm not a dairy goat uh, milk uh, F&D research. Um, I'm sure it probably exists considering what our world population of dairy goat milk consumption is, um, but it isn't anything we've looked at to date, but it is certainly, certainly something we could all benefit from learning a, a bit more about. Thank you for bringing that up. So ADGA would be the point of contact in that, and I. So I think Dr. Sutton, who I saw is on the line, knows who the folks are involved with that. So Excellent. I would encourage yes, you. and if you give them our contact information, we'd love to get connected. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Once again, if you wish to ask a verbal question please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad. Voice of a computer users, please select the raise hand emoticon from the top toolbar of your screen. And if you wish to send a written question, please send a note uh, by selecting the participants menu on the top of your screen and opt to send note to all presenters. If you're logged in using the web-based application, Please use the Notes tab on the lower right-hand side of your screen and address your notes to all moderators. Okay, well, if we don't have any um, additional questions, I did want to make one announcement. Um, we do have um, another Secure Food Supply Plan webinar coming up on November 15th, and I'll be sending out information this week about that. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, Dr. Bickett Weddle for her time um, that it took to put this all together and present today. I really appreciate it. It's very interesting. Thank you for the opportunity to, to share information and we look forward to future emails and, and additional engagement from the audience. Great. Well, if there's no other questions, then I guess we'll conclude the webinar and hope everybody has a great afternoon. <laughs>